we'll give everybody a chance to come on in. Number 585, 585, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Brother Barry's going to lead us in this song. And after that, Bruce, would you mind wording our prayer for us, please? Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your open your Bible now to the book of Hosea, and uh, I'm actually going to back up to beginning with verse 8 of chapter 7. We're going to really begin our lesson in chapter 8, but we're going to begin with chapter 7 and verse 8, uh, which is where we left off two weeks ago, and last week we had our vacation Bible school and had a great vacation Bible school. Um, I would dare say that we probably had percentage-wise the largest participation of the congregation last week in working in a VBS as we've ever had. So our numbers may not have been that many as people who came, but as far as the people who worked, we had a large number of people who worked during VBS. When you study the prophets, it's very easy for a person to look at them like they're looking at any other book of the Bible. And are there books of the Bible that you have to approach differently? For instance, if you're reading First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, you're reading a historical account of the kings. But when you get to the prophets, you have to realize they use a lot of figures of speech and a lot of uh, metaphors, if you will. And uh, if you're not careful, you'll just say, I don't have a clue what they're talking about, but you have to put yourself in their time frame and understand the uh, illustrations which they use. Another thing that I think is also important is that God gave them oracles. God gave them revelations or messages. And so they received the message the way God gave it. And God sometimes used things to remind them of their history. And if we get to chapter 9 tonight, which I don't know if we will, but if we do, uh, there'll be at least a couple of the historical references that they simply could not miss. But let's review now, beginning with verse, uh, let's pick up with verse 7 of chapter 10, or excuse me, chapter 7. He's, or verse 8, I'm sorry, of chapter 7. Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. And the pride of Israel testifies to his faith, but they do not seek the Lord, their God, nor seek him for all this. 
Now, one of the things he's trying to do is to say you are unaware of your spiritual condition. When he talks about them having gray hairs here and there on them and they don't recognize it. Do you think our country today recognizes where we are spiritually? Morally? Why is it that we don't know where we are? They don't know what God's Word says. You know, it's just like in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, when he says, Be doers of the Word, not hearers only. And then he uses an illustration of a man going and seeing himself in a mirror, and he goes away, and immediately, what does he do? He forgets what he looks like. And he says that a person who looks into the perfect law of liberty, a person who looks in God's word, he said what he's got to do is let that reflect back to him who he really is in God's sight and then make corrections and to be a doer of the word. These people simply are not doers. Now look at verses 11 through 13. Ephraim also is a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. Woe to them, for they have fled from me. Destruction to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. The second thing he's pointing out to them is they have foolishly uh, thought that they could escape the judgment of God. They've gone to Egypt. They've gone to uh, Assyria thinking that they could uh, somehow find deliverance in men rather than in God. Well, in doing so, they realize, God's trying to get them to realize, you can't run from me. Uh, whatever I have pronounced against you will happen wherever you go. And then verses 14 through verse 16. They did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. They assembled together for grain and new wine. They rebelled against me. Though I disciplined them and strengthened their arms, yet they devised evil against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for cursings of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Now, in this final section here, he's talking about their wailing, and uh, in doing so, they're wailing to their gods. Now, I do want to point out something. If you'll go back to verse 14, he says, They did not cry out to me with their heart. They wailed upon their beds. And then it says, They assembled together for grain and for new wine. The word assemble there in the Septuagint, as well as one of the Masoretic texts, the Old Testament alternate readings, is the word for lacerated or gashed. And you can say, well, what do you mean by that? Do you remember when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18? Do you remember what they did when they were crying out to Baal? Yeah, they, they, they screamed, they well, they cried. Listen to verse 28. It says there that so they cried aloud, cut themselves as their custom was with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When you look at verse 14, I'd suggest to you the way to view that is, is that they're wailing to their gods. They're wailing to their pagan gods, not to the true God. And what they're doing, they're saying, deliver us, deliver us. And in doing so, they're using... Uh, not only their screaming and their crying, but also uh, the lacerating of themselves. And uh, verse 16, they return, but not to the Most High. And he goes on to say, their derision shall be in the land of Egypt. Whenever you talk about Egypt, what does that remind you of? Bondage, being in captivity, and God is going to bring captivity upon them again. Well, that finishes chapter uh, seven and is going to lead us into chapter eight. And let me just sort of summarize for you chapters five through seven. Chapter five, God said he was bringing charges against them. 
And then in chapter 6, he begins to enumerate the charges. This is what you did. This is how you did it. And then in chapters 7 and 8, or chapter 7, they appeal to God. They say, but God, you're not being fair to us. Uh, we're not as bad as you're making us out to be. And so what you have is the response, if you will, here of God saying, no, you've not been sincere. You've not been true when you cried out to me. In fact, you continue to cry out to your pagan gods. Well, now beginning with verse 1, going through verse 3, God's sentence, if you'll think in legal terms, his sentence is going to be carried out upon them. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord because they transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel will cry to me, my God, we know you. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. Now, when you put a trumpet to your mouth, what are you going to do? What's the purpose of putting a trumpet? Blowing a horn, but what's, why do you blow the horn? To announce something. Generally, there's two things that you would announce. Worship to God was a part of their Old Testament, but more likely was the announcing of a watchman that the enemy approaches. And when you look at the second line, he shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord. Some translations say he will come like a vulture and... Uh, the original word there can refer to either one. It can be an eagle, which is also a predatory bird, but a vulture is a carrion, which is what kind of, we call them, scavengers. And in both senses, you can see this, like an eagle being a predator to, uh, to take and to kill. And so in that sense, God is saying here, first of all, to them, you know, we're going to announce that things are coming and, you know, things are going to take place. But he says here that it's almost like a, an eagle coming to swoop down as a predator or if you want to view it as in past tense, a vulture circling. You know, I know whenever I was a kid, if you looked and you saw vultures, buzzards is what we call them in Alabama. If you saw them circling, what do you know? Something's dead. And so... Uh, that's a picture here of what is taking place. And the reason why, they've transgressed my covenant, they've rebelled against my law. But then you have the protest in verse 2. Israel will cry to me, my God, we know you. What is the problem with that? Okay. Okay. Titus chapter 1 and verse 16 says, They profess to know God, but by their works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and for every good work disqualified. Or if you go to Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, he says, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You can have people crying out, we know you, we know you. Do you think when the Lord comes again, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to stand up and say, oh, yes, Lord, we're here we are, we're your people. And what is he going to say? Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. You say you know me, but you don't act like you know me. You're not living like you know me. Well, verses 4 through 6 are so important because now it, puts, it starts putting it in a historical context. They set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. From their silver and gold, they made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. My anger is aroused against them. How long until they attain unto innocence. For from Israel is even this, a workman made it, and it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. Now verses 4 through 6 have a historical connection. Now last week during vacation Bible school, I had two helpers in my class. 
I had King Rehoboam, and I had King Jeroboam. Well, King Jeroboam back there was the one who uh, is being referred to here and those who followed him. And uh, if you want to know a little bit about him, he's talking about what he did. And uh, if you'll remember, and this is what we tried to impress upon the children, King Rehoboam was not going to receive the whole kingdom because of Solomon's disobedience. But because of David, God allowed him to have two of the tribes. But ten of the northern tribes was devoted to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Could he have been a good king? Absolutely. I want you to listen to 1 Kings 11 and verse 38. He says, Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep the statutes of my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. That's speaking to Jeroboam. Could Jeroboam have done good? He could have been a great leader if he had listened. But if you keep reading, going to 1 Kings chapter 12, picking up with verse 28, it says, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold. Now stop there for just a moment. What did Rehoboam do when he became king? He asked for advice. When he had asked for advice, whose advice did he listen to? The young men when he should have listened, if any, to the older men, but the best place to have asked advice would have been of whom? God. Well, here now Jeroboam has the opportunity to do good. It says the king asked advice, and then right after that it said he made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Here is Jeroboam making calves. Now, if you go and look and see what he says here, verse 5, your calf is rejected, O Samaria. God says, I don't recognize it. I don't approve of it. If you go back to verse 4, they set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. The leaders of the northern kingdom, for the most part, were what kind of men? Wicked, vile, idolatrous. And how did they get, for most of them, their position? Was it handed down from father to son? It was by intrigue, you know, by killing, by assassination. You know, uh, it was like a lot of these third world countries today. You have a coup that rises up against this king or that king. And God said, I didn't recognize them. I didn't recognize their princes. And he says, I've rejected their calves. Well, I'd suggest to you the good background to read is 1 Kings chapter 12 and read about what all Jeroboam did and the fact that he not only changed the gods, he changed the place of worship, he changed the time of worship, and he changed the people involved in the worship. Uh, those who were set up as priests. But then it says in the latter part of verse 5, how long until they attain to innocence? How important is that question? How long shall they attain to innocence? Put it in modern day language. Paraphrase that for me. You know, what are you going to straighten up and do right? You know, it's time. It's past time. If you have a, a, a nation that goes in the wrong direction for a few years, the question is, when are things going to turn around? Um, do any of you ever have hope that maybe our country will have an eye-opening experience and maybe things will turn around? I do. Uh, I know in 1973 with Roe versus Wade, Abortion became the law of the land, 
And how many people ever thought you would see in our lifetime that change? And yet, there were some people who said, maybe things do need to change. It's not changed everywhere. And I'm hoping that sooner or later, there's some people with some common sense who maybe say, all this uh, LGBT, whatever, MSPQT, RSY, XYZ, you know, there's so many letters to it now, you can't even figure out who they're talking about. Thought it's funny today to ask the, one of the guys of the uh, military academy, they were, they were having this program offering for all of these trans people, and one of them was a demi-trans and a, another trans, and they asked him, said, what does that word mean? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. The man who's supposed to be in charge of the program didn't even know what the, the terms meant. And I, I think maybe somewhere along the line, somebody's got to say, you know, we, we need some sanity in all of this. Well, the one just recently was ruled that you can't, you know, uh, somebody can refuse to do something if it's a work of art or something like that. So it's, uh, I think that's probably a, now a dead issue, even though they've tried to push it through. But I guess the point I'm trying to drive home here is, is that he is saying here, for from Israel is even this, a workman made it and it is not God. He's trying to say all of this that you've been involved in, you've not been worshiping real gods. You're worshiping the work of man's hands. You're worshiping something, and he says, the calf of Samaria shall be broke to pieces. In other words, that's going to be done with. Now, let me take verse 7 by itself. They sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. Now, there's two ideas found in here, and that is you sow to the wind and you reap the whirlwind. What is one fact of the law of sowing and reaping? Okay. The first one is you reap what you sow, and then the second one is, that's what I was going to say, is that you always reap more than what you sow. Or at least that's the expectation that you reap more than what you sow. Galatians 6, 7, and verse 8, we're told not to be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that he shall also reap. He that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So there's the principle there that you reap what you sow. But he said he sows to the wind and he reaps the whirlwind. Uh, you get a whole lot more back than what you anticipated. And one of the commentators I was reading, and normally he is a very uh, no-nonsense commentator. You know, he follows the text and he follows the original words and stuff. But he paused at this point to talk about when he was a young man going to the coast, which would have been many, many years ago, and a hurricane came through, and everybody fled except for his family. They decided to stay in the line of the hurricane. And he said, him and his dad walked out, and they waited the water outside of the hotel where they were staying and said, you know, the wind was so strong, it was about to blow them off. And they decided to walk out to the boardwalk. And he said, you know, the, the wind and the water and everything was just tearing stuff apart, you know. And they, they ran to get out, and he thought, you know, the power of God in all of this. Well, I think about the whirlwind. I think about tornadoes where I grew up, how devastating they were. And I think about hurricanes, and I've been where they've also done their damage. The power of God that made this world that has things like hurricanes and tornadoes and typhoons, are those manifestations of mighty power? You can just see it in everything that's made. I mean, uh, I've seen places where a two-before was driven through a brick wall. 
And you just imagine the force it would take to take a piece of wood and drive it through a, a brick wall. And you think about God said, you have sown the wind, you are going to reap the whirlwind. You, you think it's going to be uh, okay. No, it's not going to be. It's going to be much stronger than you anticipated, much greater than you imagined. And then he says, the stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. I think about you have a, sow your crops and you go out. Can you imagine planting tomatoes and going out and being no tomatoes on there? Could you imagine planting corn and going out and no ears of corn on your uh, stalks? When you have to think about God saying, you're not going to have anything good come out of all this. Now, verse 8, Israel is swallowed up. Now, they are among the Gentiles like a vessel in which is no pleasure. Uh, it's almost like, for instance, what do you do if you have one of these little clay pots and it cracks? Or what do you do if you have a glass or in your house, maybe a drinking glass or a dish, a plate, and it gets a crack in it. What do you do to it? You throw it away. You discard it because it's, it's worthless now. And that's exactly what he's talking about, a vessel in which is no pleasure. God is discarding Israel in all of this. Now, verses 9 and 10. They've gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey along by itself. Ephraim has hired lovers. Yes, though they have hired among the nations, now I will gather them, and they shall sorrow a little because of the burden of the kings of princes. Now, they've gone up to Assyria. Now, um, uh, going up to Assyria was for the purpose of hiring lovers. And you say, well, I don't understand what he's talking about. Well, turn over to chapter 12 with me for just a second. Look at verse 1. Chapter 12 and verse 1. He said, Ephraim feeds on the wind and, and pursues the east wind. He daily increases lies and deceptions or desolation. Also, they make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried to Egypt. They make a covenant with the Assyrians. What are they making a covenant for? Protection. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're hedging their bets on both sides. They are hiring lovers. They're hiring people to protect them, to take care of them, if you will. And he says, though they've done that, he says, uh, like a wild donkey by itself. He says, they're just, you know, everywhere. Ephraim's hired lovers, and yet I will gather them. They'll sorrow a little because of what they've happened and what they've done. They're going to have to suffer the consequences of all this. Now, let me take verses 11 through 14 to go along with this. Because Ephraim has made many altars for sin, they have become for him altars for sinning. I have written for him great things of my law, but they considered it a strange thing. For the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it. But the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Now in verse 11, they made many altars. Um, what's the idea of building an altar? To sacrifice. But the altars that have been built in the northern kingdom have not been built for God. For whom have they been built? For the convenience, but do you remember what Jeroboam set up and said, these are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. This is that calf. And God said, that calf's not going to live. That calf's, not, that calf's going to be destroyed he said they made many altars for sin, and they become altars for sinning. 
Altars were actually for the very purpose of seeking God's favor. Uh, trying to think. Uh, you've got the, you know, the... Well, if you don't know God's law, you know, he's already said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Uh, you know, if people who do not know history are condemned to repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, our, our country does not learn very well, does it? No, no country does. And people tend to forget. And, but if you forget God's history, that's where it's really the problem. And uh, these altars that God has warned them, don't make them. And uh, the altars are supposed to be built where God wants them to be built. But I want you to take verse 12. with This is an important verse here because he says, I have written for him great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. God's given them great things in his law, and there's a whole lot that could be said about the great things in his law. But... Uh, my point would be to draw about this is he said they're a strange thing to them. And the word strange there is the same word for the word alien. Uh, where there, it's like it's another country's religion, another country's book of law or something, something such as that. And, uh, you know, you go back to chapter 4, verse 1, he says, there's no mercy, there's no truth, there's no knowledge of God in the land. Chapter 4, verse 6, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being priests before me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. He's saying you keep forget, 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 forget. And because of that, you get to verse 13, for the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. When they do offer sacrifices to God, does God accept those sacrifices? No. And the parallel of this passage is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 1. You know, in Isaiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 11, going through verse 20, do you remember Isaiah said, Who has required you to trample my courts? He said, Your feast, your new moons, Away with them. God says, I don't want to accept them. I don't, I'm not interested in your sacrifices anymore as long as you're not living right. And uh, that is exactly the case here. The Lord will not accept them. And for that reason, he'll remember their iniquity. And he says, they shall return to Egypt. Now, verse 14, by itself here. For Israel has forgotten his maker. And has built temples. Judah also has multiplied fortified cities. But I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour his palaces. Now, what you have at the end of chapter 8 is simply God saying, this is where Israel made its mistake. It went down this path of building temples because they've forgotten their maker they've forgotten the real god when you look at king ahab the king of the north who was he worshiping baal and when you read first kings chapter 18 and you read about elijah confronting him and he asked him you know ahab says is that you old trouble of israel and how does Elijah respond? It's not me who's troubled Israel, but you and your house. You've forsaken the living God. And that's where the challenge that comes on Mount Carmel takes place. Israel has gone this direction. Not far behind is whom? Judah. 
It says Judah also has multiplied fortified cities. Now, for just a minute, what do you, what, what's the idea about having fortified cities? Protection. In whom are they placing their confidence? They're, they're fortified cities. Their arms. Look, look what we have done to protect ourselves. Their dependency was not upon God, but their dependency was upon themselves. And you can see that when you study the correlation between the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, you see the kings of the Israel doing what to the kings of Judah? Leading them astray and placing confidence. With, well, should we go up against this nation? Well, I'll go up with you. I'll be your buddy. I'll be your pal. I'll be your friend. And uh, God asked the question, should you love those who hate the Lord? Should you join forces with those who are working against God? And what he's saying to them here is Judah has also multiplied fortified cities. Judah's also following the same pathway. But I will send fire upon his cities and it shall devour his palaces. Judah's just only a little bit behind what Israel is doing and Judah's going to have to be punished as well as Israel is punished. It just, it will be later. 722 is when Assyria comes against the northern kingdom, takes it captive. 586 is when Babylon comes, or really 606 is when it starts, but 586 is when the ultimate destruction of the temple takes place. But you have about a hundred, maybe 120 year period of time where the fall of the northern kingdoms and then the fall of the southern kingdom starts. And what God is trying to do, this is a shot across the bow for the children of Israel that are in Judah. You need to listen to this. This is a warning. If a parent has to discipline an older child, is that a message to the younger child as well? <laughs> it is a message, now the, 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 but will they listen? Sometimes they will see and they'll say, if that's what it takes, I'm going to be good. Sometimes they don't learn the lesson. In this case, Judah did not learn the lesson. Okay, do you have any questions about chapter 8? They could have prevented this, though, could they not? Judges chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 6. They did not drive out the inhabitants of the land, and they became temptations, thorns in their side. Had they done what God told them to do in the very beginning, what would have happened? Our problem is we don't recognize it being for our good. We, we tend to think we know better than God, and, uh, but compromise, giving up on your convictions, failing to listen to God all have consequences that follow. And we just finished the book of Judges in our Monday morning Bible class, and it's been awful to see the way the children of Israel lived during the period of the Judges. But there was a phrase, chapter 21, verse 25 says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They just simply chose to follow themselves, their own plans. And when man becomes his own master, then he's in trouble because that's when he's, he's following himself. Well, I really intended to try to cover chapter 9 tonight but I didn't think y'all thought I would be able to do that anyway. But uh, we'll pick up with chapter 9, Lord willing, next Wednesday evening. Sure.
Welcome everybody to Bobby Branch uh, Church of Christ this Wednesday evening. Uh, just a few announcements we have. Um, we've got our summer series still going on this Sunday with uh, speaker Ralph Richardson. Um, this topic is challenges to the family perversions of marriage. We were having our uh, elders and deacons meeting July 30th at 5 p.m. and then the quarter biz, quarterly business meeting after services that evening. East End is having, a, we'll begin a summer series on Sunday, the August the 6th, beginning at 5 p.m. There's a gospel meeting at the Jericho Congregation from July 23rd to the 26th. Um, there's Vacation Bible Schools, 23rd to the 26th at Chestnut Grove and at Rock Cliff. There is a visitation team number four will meet in room one following uh, Sunday services, I guess. Is that right? um, the youth, there's a youth gospel meeting. It's going to, the Malio congregation is having a youth gospel meeting the last Sunday and Monday of August. They will meet at 7.30 both evenings. Travis, is, uh, Travis Adams will be speaking on Sunday evening, and Landon Averitt will be speaking on Monday evening. Please mark your calendars and go support these young men. If, you, if you're going on the white water rafting trip, please see Jason if you haven't paid. And, and sign your waiver online. Um, and the sick for tonight. The invitation song is 924. And the scripture reading will be 1 Kings 19, 18. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. And let us all stand and sing. Sing hallelujah to the Lord.
please bow. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and everything you've done for us. Thank you for allowing us to gather here safely and please let us all have a safe trip back. And please let us apply the lesson we're about to hear. Let, it, let us apply it to our lives and we can be the light in the world, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The reading will be 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have, been, have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed man. Probably most of you have experienced this. Have you ever been to the doctor, shown to the examination room, and whoever took you back there said, the doctor will see you shortly. Last time I experienced that, I said, yeah, I've heard that before. And the guy that took me back there laughed because I'm sure he had said that many times and, and was hoping that maybe that would be the case. But you sit there for a while and waiting and waiting and you start to get restless and then after another little while, you do like I have done before, really. said, have they all gone home and left me here? And am I locked in? Of course, then after a while, you realize that's not really true. That there are other patients that the doctor is see, seeing. Maybe something unexpected came up, and the doctor's having to spend some unforeseen extra time with one of his or her patients. But all the time, if you're anything like me, you've been playing solitaire on your phone while you wait. And that is kind of a segue into my first topic. And my first topic is the game of solitaire. Sometimes a game of solitaire starts off real well. Many plays come up, and pretty soon the cards are getting turned over like mad. And this looks like a sure win. And then right before all of the cards have been turned over, you reach a dead end. Just no plays left. And old Saul, as my mother used to call him way back in the day, has won the game. Now some of you, if you were born since maybe 1990 or 1995, you're saying, how is this possible? They didn't have cell phones way back then. You couldn't play solitaire. Well, they had these little cardboard things called playing cards, and my mother used to love to play solitaire. On the other hand, sometimes just the opposite happens. You start a solitaire game, it looks like it's not going anywhere. You keep on plugging away, though, and don't give up, and sometimes, behold, by and by, things start falling into place. Amazingly, you wind up beating old Saul in spite of what it looked like at the outset. And that is segue number two. We were discussing this at home recently. I'm the solitaire player at my house, uh, not Marcia. But anyway, uh, my lovely and talented wife said something to the effect that this was a lot like life, and it certainly is. Sometimes a good situation turns out to lead into big problems. And so then on the other hand, a bad situation might wind up as having a positive outcome. I think the case of Elijah the prophet probably illustrates both of these points. After the contest on Mount Carmel, where Elijah, through God, of course, defeated the prophets of Baal and had the prophets of Baal all killed, it looked like things were really going great, but then Enter Ahab and Jezebel. First Kings, verse 19, uh, chapter 19 and verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, The gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now after the great victory on Mount Carmel, you'd think uh, Elijah would think, Well, that doesn't scare me. God's with me. But no, he got scared and he ran for his life. 1 Kings 19, verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree 
and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Jehovah, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He finally wound up way down at uh, Mount Sinai, hiding in a cave. In verse 14, and he said, I have been very zealous for Jehovah, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Well, God assured Elijah that he was not alone and that things were going to go God's way, not the way of Ahab and Jezebel. And you heard read verse 18 a while ago. Yet will I leave me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Of course, eventually uh, Ahab and Jezebel were killed for all of their sins. What about you and what about me tonight? Sometimes do we feel like giving up when things seem to be falling apart? I want to read the end of Romans chapter 8. It's several verses, but I think we'll still get out of here by 8 o'clock. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 29 through the end of the chapter. For whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And, when, and whom he foreordained, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ Jesus that died, yea, rather, that was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or anguish, or persecution, or famine, or, or uh, nakedness, or peril, or sword? Even as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord." When things seem to be going bad, when everything is terrible, we need to hang in there because God is going to eventually work all things out for good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. But always keep in mind that when things are going well, we don't need to be overconfident. Don't be a pessimist, but be prepared to face the hard times that are probably ahead because that's just the way that life is. If you're not a Christian, why not become one tonight? You've been putting it off and putting it off. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. You don't have the promise of five minutes after eight o'clock. You also don't know but what your heart might eventually become so hardened because of just not dealing with it and that becomes what you're used to and you wind up never dealing with it and that has happened to countless millions of people. So stop putting it off. The stakes are just too high. If you're a Christian tonight who have erred, who have made some mistakes, well, guess what? Who hasn't? You need to correct that. But in either case, if you're not a child of God or if you are a child of God who is straight away, uh, you need to correct that tonight. In either case, if you need to respond, won't you do that right now? as we stand to sing this invitation song. <laughs>
Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we've had the privilege to come together this evening in this place and to study from your word. We pray that each one of us will go about our lives and use the things that we have learned this evening to help us to be better people as we walk upon this earth. Heavenly Father, please forgive us whenever we do the things that are wrong and we fall short and we leave things undone that we shouldn't. We know that we are sinful creatures and we're weak and we should rely on you for our strength. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus who died on the cross that we may have forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.